Okay, so I'm Struan. Uh, I'm the product director, Natural Motion. There's a couple of bits missing off the bottom of that, actually. Hopefully, that won't actually affect most of the rest of the presentation. Um, I'm the product director at Natural Motion. Um, and this talk today is going to be, um, it's kind of a lessons learned thing. So we've been making freemium games now for um, about 18 months. And we released our first one, which is My Horse, in September of last year. And it's kind of looking at how our thinking has evolved from that first game that we released, um, My Horse, to uh, a game we released just over a month ago, which is CSR Racing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about our kind of philosophy on the App Store, our philosophy and kind of where we think the, the market's going, but also um, specific things from both of those games. Um, so I guess when I sat down to write this talk, the, uh, the first thing that occurred to me was um, what Natural Motion did next. Well, why should you guys even care what Natural Motion did next? Um, and I'd like to think that kind of people out there have heard of us, but that perhaps people aren't kind of waiting on, uh, on tenterhooks for, uh, for what we're going to do next. Um, but you should care because kind of this is the state of the App Store at the moment, right? This is the state of free-to-play games. It's a little bit harsh, um, and I, I have no problems with zoo games. I have no problems with resource management games. I've played all those games. I enjoy those games. But if you look at those, you're quite hard pushed to tell the difference between them, right? And with the cost of, um, of acquisition going up, I mean, there was something Christian was just talking about there, um, the cost per acquisition uh, for advertising to new users is rising all the time. You have to find a way of standing out. You have to find a way of getting people to download your game instead of one of those other games. And we think, a little bit dramatic, um, we think that uh, with My Horse and with CSR Racing, um, we found a new way. We found a new way of making free-to-play games on the App Store that, that don't require this kind of heavy cost per acquisition model to get users into the game because they stand on their own two feet. They stand out, they're polished, um, and they're different. Uh, and that's why I think it's kind of worth listening to what we have to say today. Um, OK, so I'm going to break the talk into four sections. The first, I'm going to talk a little bit about us as a company, kind of our history, and, and why we think about making the games, um, why we think about making games in the way that we do. I'm going to talk about the market. I'm going to talk about my horse. And then I'm going to talk specifically about kind of the lessons from my horse and, uh, and how they apply to CSR racing. OK, so natural motion games. Um, we started making mobile games about three years ago. Um, and we've made uh, a couple of American football games called Backbreaker and Backbreaker 2. We made another one, NFL Rivals. We made an ice hockey game called Icebreaker. And then, um, somewhat incongruously, we made Jenga uh, on the iPhone. And all of those games have kind of had three core tenets uh, that run through them, the way we, we think about making games. The first one is that we like to make games that are console quality. Right from the beginning, we've thought that the iPhone, um, uh, the iPad, Android phones have the power to make something that is console quality. And I don't mean making console experiences. I don't mean like twin stick shooters on an iPad, which I don't really think works that well. Um, but making games that have 3D visuals, that have really high quality audio, really high quality UI. That console experience, that feeling you get from playing a console game. Um, games that are addictive. So games that are short play session, but games that leave you with that kind of one more, just one more go at the end of it. And that we've concentrated very hard on making that. Um, and then, I guess this kind of runs through those last two things. We've concentrated on making games that are polished. Um, so we kind of have a joke in the office that, uh, it's not a very funny joke, um, that um, if something could be like one pixel out of line, we will send it back and get it done again. And that kind of pisses off artists and programmers. But, um, but we really do care about the quality of our games. And if something isn't right, if we don't feel something is 100% right, we send it back and we do it again until it's right. And that's been successful for us. So um, all of those games uh, have been top 10 hits. They've all been over five times ROI positive. So they all sold for 99 cents to 2.99, but they were all over um, five times ROI positive. They're all at least four and a half star. Most of them kind of average nearer five star ratings on the App Store. Um, Backbreaker was one of the biggest new sports IP on iOS. There were over 20 million downloads of those games. So we were pretty good at making premium games. Um, but in 2011, um, our CEO, Torsten Roll, uh, decided there were greater opportunities in the free-to-play space. And I think a lot of people over the last year saw that the mobile games world really shifted from premium to freemium. Uh, and that led to our first game, My Horse. Um, we released it in September last year. Uh, it was featured as App of the Week by Apple, which we we're really proud of. That's, that's quite an accolade. Um, it's basically a nurturing game. You have a horse in a field. You, uh, you feed it. You clean the paddock. You buy it a new saddle. You enter it into competitions. Um, it's like a very advanced Tamagotchi. And, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of why that was important to the demographic we chose uh, later on. But um, clearly, we did something right, because it's had over 10 million downloads. In fact, if people have seen me talk before, they've probably seen this slide. It's a bit of an old slide. Um, 
We've had over 11 million downloads now, and we have over 500,000 daily active users with the game. So it's been pretty successful. We're pretty happy with that. Um, and then uh, about a month and a half ago, we launched uh, CSR Racing. Uh, that is also free to play. It was editor's choice with the, uh, on iOS, so that's kind of what App of the Week is now. Um, and again, that was, pretty big, uh, that was a pretty big deal for us. Um, in fact, it was editor's choice in, I think, every app store around the world except for three that we could find, and I've never known a game be, um, be featured quite so heavily by Apple before in the past, so uh, that was a pretty big deal. Um, kind of characterized by stunning visuals. Racing games have pretty much always led the way on consoles with... Uh, with how they look. And if you look at kind of Gran Turismo, Project Gotham, uh, Forza, those games have always been kind of stunning visual affairs. And that was something that we really set out to do with CSR Racing. And I think it probably is one of, if not the best looking game on the iPad. Um, it was number one free and number one top grossing in the US and the UK and a bunch of other app stores as well. It's still riding very high in those charts. Um, and if kind of it was characterized by stunning visuals, also characterized by something um, that I'll talk about a little bit later, which is quite a simple core loop. It was quite, um, it was quite short and it's quite addictive. And, and I'll go into kind of why that works a little bit later on in the presentation. And if kind of those core tenets of console games and addictive play and polish kind of run through all our games, something that runs through uh, the company is this idea of continuous improvement. And that's kind of part and parcel of the thing why we've been, ex uh, why we've been successful and uh, and kind of why it's, I guess, worth listening to um, our development philosophy. And that continuous improvement runs from everything right down from the CEO right down to kind of uh, the QA guys. But we do that in a variety of ways. We do a lot of market analysis. We play a ton of games out there. We, um, any game that kind of rises up the free charts, any game that rises up the top grossing charts, we play it, we look at it, we try to understand why that game was successful. We're not interested in copying game mechanics from other people, but we are interested in understanding the motivations behind, like, why have players engaged with that particular game in that particular way? Um, we do a lot of analytics. Uh, so we have a great analytics team. Um, they pour over the numbers on a daily basis. Every game that we make has pretty well instrumented um, game events. And we try to understand why people are playing our games in the way that they're playing them and, and how we can kind of translate that to the games that we're making. We also do a lot of dog fooding. Um, so we play our games pretty obsessively. Uh, we have a product lead on every game. That's the person who kind of runs the game team. And the product leads play one another's games. It's kind of like a mandatory thing. They play one another's games. Um, and they give pretty harsh feedback. But we kind of um, we cultivate that as a company to make sure that people are being quite blunt about things that are and aren't working in a game. And once you kind of get over that, it's, it's actually very useful. Because when you're making the game, when you are the product lead yourself on a game, you usually can't see the wood for the trees. You know, you could be focusing on the minutiae, the, the small problems you have to solve on a day-to-day -day basis, and you might have missed something that was kind of glaringly, obviously wrong with your game in the first place. So that dog feeding, that introspection is really important to us. Okay, so I talked a bit about market analysis. Uh, how do we see the mobile games market? Well, we, we see that it's changing. Um, so one, it's growing. Those are pretty circumspect figures, but there's over half a billion um, smartphones out there and people are using them. Um, I, I mean, I think, that, I think that number's more. Those are the numbers I could find on the internet that I was kind of comfortable using. But that ecosystem allows for quite a wide selection of games to be made. So those are screenshots I took uh, a few weeks ago from the What's Hot section of the App Store. And if you look at those games, that's quite a wide variety of games that people are playing there, right? Um, that's casual, it's kids. There's the flipping king of fighters in there. It doesn't get more hardcore than that. The sports games, there's racing games. That ecosystem is really vibrant and allows, for, allows you to think beyond just making yet another zoo game, right? You can do quite a lot with that number of people who own these devices. So two, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, the idea that um, free-to-play games are getting more sophisticated. The quality bar is going up, and that's something that people kind of need to get their heads around. Um, these devices are capable of console quality power. Um, that's just a screenshot from CSR. It's kind of undocked. It's a pretty good looking game. You can do quite a lot with, uh, with these devices, and you need to start thinking about how you're going to use that in order to differentiate your game. Because um, differentiation is the third thing that we see as kind of being one of the major areas that the market's moving towards. Um, if you want to stand out, if you want to try and combat the idea that um, advertising to users is getting more and more expensive and it's getting harder and harder to do on a daily basis, you need to be unique. You need to stand out in some way. And you can do that with uh, really good Facebook integration. That's one way of doing it. And you can do that with kind of other viral methods, so email, um, Twitter kind of built into your app. But 
One of the greatest things we have going for us is something that um, I call tactile virality. So the idea that the game looks good or feels good um, and it's something that people want to show to their friends and that is a really powerful method for spreading the word. If you have a game that does something stunning, does something that people want to show their friends, so in my horse it's the, the animation and the movement of the horse and in CSR racing it's the look of the cars, then you will get kind of a lot of virality which will help you keep your cost per acquisition much lower. And kind of overall, we see that the app store is kind of changing. Um, there's a lot of new players coming in, and these people are kind of like new, the, the new gamers. They might have played a Spectrum game 20 years ago, they might have played a Nintendo game 20 years ago, but they don't consider themselves to be gamers. Um, but they're enjoying games on their iPhone, they're enjoying games on their Android phone. What do you do to kind of make the most of that? At the moment, they're playing games that are kind of, they're not playing Space Invaders and Pac-Man, per se, but they're playing games that are kind of the equivalent of that. They're quite basic, they're quite, uh, they're quite early, um, and that's encouraging a lot of people to make kind of clones of those games. So you have the kind of the Galaxian and the Ms. Pac-Man kind of uh, type games going on. But if kind of looking at the arcade, looking at the history of video games has kind of taught us anything, is that these get much more sophisticated and the gamers will go with that. These people who are just discovering kind of the simpler games now will come with you and they will they will find the games that are um, a little bit deeper or have greater graphical sophistication, and that's kind of where we see the market go. Okay, so how did we use that thinking to make sure that in Horse we were building the right game? Well, so Horse is basically about looking after uh, a horse, right? And the first thing, the most important thing to us was making it feel like it was a believable horse. We're pretty sure that if you had a 2D horse in a 2D field, people aren't going to be as engaged. They aren't going to feel like coming back and looking after that horse on a daily basis. It needed to feel as real as possible. So we put a huge amount of time and effort into motion capturing the horse. That's a pretty ridiculous problem to solve. Um, into the animation networks to make sure that the horse felt like it was moving around in a natural way. Um, into the modeling of the horse itself, into the texturing of the horse. I mean, that was a huge time sink, a huge amount of, um, of dev effort went into that. But it was totally worth it because what you get out of that is something that we call the magic moment. It's the first, the first thing you do in the game is the horse is kind of standing in a field side on and it's got its head bowed and you have to tap on the screen and you beckon the horse over and it takes a little bit of persistence. You have to do it a few times but eventually the horse comes over and you get this screen where he's looking at you and you kind of you stroke him and he nuzzles you and you feed him a carrot and then the, the, the horse, the, the kind of the stable hand pops up and goes, hey, the horse really likes you. Why don't you give him a name? And at that point, you have really bonded with the horse. You kind of feel like you have some emotional connection with the horse. Um, and kind of rule 101 of your tutorial funnel is don't make people do repeated actions. Don't make them do things that, uh, that are confusing and not necessarily well explained. And we kind of fly in the face of that a little bit because it, it, the magic moment is not always the easiest thing to understand what you have to do at that point. But that was worth it to us because it was worth it to make sure that by the end of that, the user was properly bonded with the horse, otherwise why were they going to come back and feel the need to feed it in the first place? Um, I think the other thing is that we thought quite long and hard about play patterns on mobile. So it talks about making console experiences, but we don't want to make console games. So when a, a gamer sits down to play a console, they've put a disc in a machine, they've, they've sat back on their sofa, they're doing lean back play, as I think people call it. Um, they have made a conscious decision to play a game for a period of time in their life and you've got them for at least 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, seven hours, 24 hours, depending on you know, their addiction level, I guess, uh, or how much of a life they have. Um, mobile games are pretty different, right? You play a mobile game before a meeting starts, on the bus, on the loo. Different usage needs different design. You can't just port console thinking, console design over to a mobile game. You should never underestimate how frequently you can get somebody to play your game, right? If they have their mobile phone on them all the time, you can get them to play loads and loads of game sessions a day. But never underestimate just how little time they're actually going to give your game per session. I think that, um, according to Flurry, the median session length for a, a racing game is 1.9 minutes. Um, I mean, I know that because I know that CSR is much higher than that, but um, that's terrifying. Like, that's not much time at all. Like, to give somebody a complete experience, to make them enjoy that 1.9 minutes that they had and want to come back and do that again is a completely different challenge to making any kind of games that you've made before on a console. And that different play style 
I guess kind of manifested itself in, in the different things that you can do in horse. So in horse you can do this thing where you just basically tap around, I don't know why my horse is wearing a witch's hat, I apologise for that. Um, you can kind of just tap around the paddock and the horse will run around the paddock and, and, and follow it round. And you don't, there's no goal there, you, don't, you get a little bit of XP for doing it, but there's no actual purpose to do it, you just play with the horse. Um, and then you kind of have the next thing which is where you, you tend them, you do the actual mini game tasks, you clean it, you, uh, you clean out the paddock, you feed it. And those have goals because they have a purpose for doing it, but they're pretty straightforward. There's no like, skill involved. Um, and then you have focused play, which is the competitions where you have to kind of press a button at the right time to make the horse jump over the fence or step over the poles or run around the barrels. And so that's a different kind of game again. You know, it's a slightly longer play session that the user is concentrating. They're, they're hopefully in some sort of state of flow at that point. Um, and then we have these other things, the callbacks and timers. So you can go into the game, you can basically tap on those buttons and send your horse away to go and do a task, a quest, and they come back with XP and they come back with coins or they come back with happiness or health or any of the meters you're trying to move to keep your horse in balance. Um, and that's, that happens while your phone's in your pocket. So the game is kind of even playing while your phone's in your pocket. You get a push notification and that calls you back to the game. So we've done lots of different play styles and lots of different play times in the game because we understood that before that meeting, when you get your phone out and you're just doing that thing where you, you flip the screens backwards and forwards because you can't not have your phone in your hand at any one time. Um, you see the app, you see the horse app, and you think, actually, I could play that right now. I could, I could devote 20 seconds of my life to tapping the horse uh, around the field, or I've got five minutes, I might, I might want to do a competition. Or, hey, look, he, the quest is finished, I could go and claim my items. The more reasons you give somebody to come back to the game, the more likely they are to come back to the game. It kind of fits. So we put a lot of time and effort into thinking about that in the game. Um, and that was good. So horse worked for us. That, you know, those are good stats. We were pleased with the success of it, but we wanted to improve. And I think one of the things we knew, I guess it's fairly obvious, is that the, the demographics were going to be quite different between making a horse game and, and, a, and a racing game. Like a horse obviously skews quite female, it skews quite young. Um, well, they're not as young as you necessarily would think. Um, and, and a racing game is obviously going to skew to, to boy racers. Um, so how do we take the learning from horse and how do we make that actually um, apply to a racing game? Um, oh yeah, new demographic, adapting your thinking. Um, well, the first thing we realised is that play patterns, so the thing we'd looked at in horse, that they're per game, right? They don't, they're not relevant necessarily across different games. So just because the, the different types of play worked well on my horse, it doesn't mean that that was going to work well for CSR. Because casual users and hardcore users, this is an awful slide, um, they have different expectations and you need different design to kind of feed those expectations. Um, they, that's awful, but she's impressed by the fact that there is a 3D horse in a field. That's like magic, right? Um, and, and he, because there are other people as well. But this guy has very different expectations from a game because he's a gamer and he is expecting the game to have win and loss conditions. He's expecting that to be exciting. He's expecting action from the game. Um, and I'm sorry for using she and he, that is really pretty awful, but um, it got the point across. Um, so rather than do these kind of different play patterns, we focused in CSR racing on a very tight core loop. And what do I mean by core loop? I've mentioned that a couple of times. Well, pretty simply in games, a core loop is you do a thing, you get a thing, and you expand your things. And I've used, I've used this slide before. People have, people have seen this before. Um, but that's pretty universal for, for all games, but it's particularly important for social games to understand how to keep that game simple and how to keep it pure. And in CSR, that kind of translates into enter a race, win some cash, buy an upgrade for your car, enter into a more difficult race. Um, and the, if you understand your core loop in your game, if you understand how you've kept that simple, how you've kept that um, pure, then you can understand all of the items that you do at different stages, and you can understand where you can put the gates for monetization as well in there. So what are the things that you might be able to do that would uh, get people to have a faster experience, uh, a more enhanced experience, join that VIP club that was mentioned in the last, um, in the last talk? Like, what can you do at those various stages to encourage people to do that? Um, and so it's pretty important that you understand each element of that. So in CSR, we put, um, oh, no, sorry, one more slide. Um, and once you understand your core loop, you understand the concept of play sessions and cadence. So a play session is made up of several versions of the core loop, so several times around that core loop. You might have several races in CSR in a play session. Um, and kind of the life cycle of your game is basically just several of these play sessions chained together. And in a social game, in a mobile game, understanding the length of that play session allows you to understand 
at what point the user's going to put the game down and, and like, have you given them a satisfying experience at that point and then have you given them a reason to be called back to the game. So in CSR, it's quite simply um, they run out of gas at that point and maybe some people want to keep playing, maybe they want to do another play session, but, um, but at that point they run out of gas, they put the game down, um, when it's filled back up, the gas refills over time, then the, the game calls them back and says, hey, your gas is refilled, get back into the game. So understanding the, the length of time it takes for that gas to run out was really important for us because that had to fit with kind of what felt to be a good play session for the user. And also knowing that at that point, that's a possible monetization point. If your game is really good and people want to go beyond that put down point, then they might pay to stay in the game. Um, so that core loop, Polish the core loop, that's my horse lesson one with the fancy green thing popping in there. Um, we spent, it kind of gives me nightmares even looking at those screens sometimes, we spent an ungodly amount of time polishing those screens and going back over it because this is basically the core loop of CSR. This map screen is where you choose the race, press the big race button down there to go and do it. The race itself lasts kind of 15 seconds. It's just a drag racing game, it's just a side on drag racing game. You have to change gear at the right time. But all the effort we put into the cameras, into the feedback into the audio there was designed to make that 15 seconds a pretty intense experience. The, um, the race results screen at the end is full of kind of flashing lights and all the kind of the ways in which you earned money throughout the race and, and like you're not to 60 times, you're not to 100 times, it's kind of full of stats and information. Um, and then this kind of the slightly calm period where you go back to your car in the workshop and you can play around with your car, you can rotate it, you can look at it, you can send pictures of the car to your friends, you can buy new decals of ridiculous pink monsters to put on your car. Um, all of that was worth the effort we put into it because the game's been successful. But we needed to understand where those were and, and where they were in the core loop and put the direct the dev effort into those screens in particular. Um, so I guess my horse lesson two is that this concept of tactile ownership and kind of graphical showcase. So in horse, the horse was always front and center. It was standing in a field, it was moving around. It made you want to kind of play with it and interact with it. In CSR, the equivalent is this workshop screen where the car, the lighting plays off the paintwork, all the effort we put into paint shaders um, pays off, the kind of lovely soft shadow under the car. Every single bit of detail in that was worked on extensively and made it feel like that was something that you wanted to go back to, but also that's that point where you want to show your friends, look, there's my um, Mustang GT T2 303. Um, that I'm rotating and, and I'm showing you and I, all, all the effort I put into customizing that car and, and, and building up my time with that car. Um, lesson three is this concept of carrots and sticks where I sometimes lose people. But in a core loop, you have to have carrots and sticks. You have to have the carrots, which are the motivational pull, the reasons you want to keep going around that core loop. Um, and in CSR, that's the cars. That's, I want that supercar. I want to go to the Ford dealership and buy that Ford GT. But I know how much it costs, and I've got to earn the money to get there. And I know what, what point that, that unlocks in the game for me to actually be able to, to get that or to make it useful. Um, so there's this motivational reason for wanting to keep going around the core loop and earn more. But also kind of the stick, and not kind of in a negative way, but the kind of the driving force, the thing that kicks somebody around the core loop is this screen here, the race results screen. Like that is so... It's such a kind of visual and audio-visual feast that it makes them leave the race with a great feeling and it makes them kind of want to go back and do it again. Right? It kind of kicks them around into the next bit of the loop and the carrot then pulls them on to, the, net, to the, uh, the subsequent part. And it's really important to understand what are your carrots and sticks in the game and then direct the dev effort into those as well. Um, I guess lesson four from Horse is good old Dan the stable hand up there who was quite a ridiculous looking man, um, was really popular in my horse. Like, re like we got so much feedback from Zendesk about how much people liked down the stable hand that we put other cheesy characters in the game as well. Um, and so for CSR, we understood that kind of, you know, in a game you've made about horses, a game you've made about cars, you do, human beings like human beings to be in the game, right? So we needed some characters. So in CSR, it's kind of broken up into um, five tiers, you have uh, five tiers of progress in the game and each tier it has a boss and each boss has four crew members and this is the tier three boss, Aliada's uh, crew members. Um, and you have to beat each one of these in turn before you're allowed to take on the boss. So we put, we actually got the script writer from Dead Space um, and um, a, a pretty decent graphic novelist to come up with those characters because we knew the time and effort put into making those characters believable, making them look good, 
would lead to this kind of question of, well, who's next? Like, what's next in the game? And kind of, it would give you this well-marked sense of progression. I beat that guy, I beat Professor D, hell with that guy, I'm on to the next person. And the time and effort in making those people more than just a name in the game was well worth it because, uh, again, we kind of know from feedback, we know from the way people are playing the game that this is a really important part of, of why the game has been successful. Lesson five is this idea of cohesive narrative. If you're going to do something in the game, make sure it fits within the narrative of the game. So rather than have a fuel system, um, a fuel system rather than have an energy system in the game, or rather than have races that kind of um, took their time to, to come back um, in the game, we, we put in this idea of fuel. Until we, until we did that, when we were doing usability tests, people really didn't get why sometimes the, the play sessions would come to an end. They never got any of the other attempts that we, we put in to kind of limit the time in the game. Um, and until we put the gas in, uh, it didn't make it, it just, when we put that in, it just worked. People understood it when we were usability testing. They understood why they, they had to stop at that point. Um, and finally, as I kind of run out of time and careen towards the end, um, this concept of lovely wrapping, I've talked about this before. Um, you're, if, if you're making a free-to-play game, your game is a shop front, and you have to appreciate that. You have to understand that people are buying things within your game and that that has to have some kind of perceived value. And kind of the masters of this, well, on one hand, it's Amazon, um, but on the other hand, it's these guys, it's Apple. I, I've spent an awful lot of money on Apple products in my life, um, m more money than anyone, in, I mean, either me or my wife would care to uh, think about. But I always feel good about it because the Apple store is such a nice place to be and that box is beautiful and wow, look at that, I've got an iPhone. Um, I'm cool, I'm like a hipster. Um, and they've done this, <laughs> they've done this thing where it, it, it makes you feel good even though you've spent quite a large amount of money. And you can do that in a game, right? So the cars are nice and shiny in CSR, but also you get XP when you buy a car. Um, you get a sense of progression when you buy a car. Making the most of those moments will mean that people feel less bad. They should never feel bad, but they'll, they'll enjoy spending the hard currency in the game. And you have to kind of try and take that attitude with your game. It is a shop front. It is something in which you are selling things. It's a free game as well. Like, respect that. People are allowed to play that game for free, and that's, and that's fine. Um, but when someone does buy something, make them feel special for doing it. And that, in summary, is basically it. So kind of the, the thoughts I want to leave you with are know your games. So know the games that you've got out in the market, but know the game you're making. Understand what it is that makes that game tick. Know the marketplace itself, right? That's, it's shifting all the time. People are innovating. People are bringing out cool things all the time on iOS and Android. Play all those games. Understand all those games. What, it, what is it about those games that are making them successful? What is it about those games that, aren't, that, mean, that mean they aren't successful? Um, know your core loop. We talk quite a lot about that. Know your users, like understand what they want from the game. Like understand the users you've got in, in games that you've already made and understand why they might then play another game that you make. And learn from everyone. We spend a huge amount of time speaking to other people from the industry, learning from other people's games, talking about what has been successful in their games and what hasn't been. And that's a pretty important part of why our most recent games have been very successful. That is kind of it from me, other than to say that we are hiring pretty much everyone pretty much everywhere. So if you want to come and speak to me afterwards, then do. And we have time for no questions, or? Um, if we've got a quick one, but uh, we are running a bit over. Just one, up the back. one question at the back, yeah. This better be a good one, no pressure. <laughs> I'm just curious what your thoughts are on the world's greatest horse game, Klopp. Um, yeah, I love Klopp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely be going and playing that after this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's it. Cheers. Cheers.